thank you so much vijayanti good afternoon everybody uh, my name is prayang jain and i'm very very happy uh, to be part of this series um firstly i must say that um, i learned about the center the just transition research center earlier this year when you had released a report on the tax implications of the just transition and how the coal uh, projects and you know different state taxes are very much interlinked and uh, it was a joy to come through and you know go through the work that the center is doing um, it is if there is one place in india that attention on just transition in an exclusive way while leveraging leveraging academic and research it is this place so i'm very very happy uh, to be part uh, here i've been you know past few days going through your website in more detail seeing the body of work you know the level of expertise that's there so thank you so much for having me um that said uh, we have one hour together and um i believe that you know we will be able to create a discussion because there is much to learn from both sides uh, i work on one aspect of the climate problem and you know from a more global intersectoral angle and uh, i think i bring more questions than answers but they, these are questions that all of us are collectively working on so if we you know as i uh, run through the kind of thoughts and ideas i have and you know sharing the different perspectives maybe we can use the second half of the discussion to actually hear from from the members here you know i'll be very much happy to uh, build that exchange um that being said um i would like to highlight one very important thing uh, which is you know when we are talking about youth and just transition um <clears throat> there are two strands of conversations that are happening at the world level one is the more soft diplomacy stuff which is give youth a place uh, in the forums allow them in decision making create uh, mechanisms that make youth um, you know a mandatory party and then there is a second hard ground reality of what uh, states like let's say chatisgarh jharkhand are seeing about you know how do you transition how do you move away from coal mines but you take care of those lakhs of people that are dependent in communities and i think those are the critical issues that i want to focus on today because that is where there is a uh, room to dig deeper um in the course of preparation you know i i've chosen less to focus more on global governance issues which are the areas in which i work and rather take this as an opportunity to ask myself and all of you some questions you know on what is happening uh, for middle income countries how realities you know differ and what are the two different stories that are developing the story of transitions and climate proofing cities and you know a green future is very different in tier 1 cities in india than you know tier 2 and tier 3 cities so how do we club that and i feel this is a right atmosphere and the community to be asking and discussing these issues so this is some broad context you know with which i want to start um the present landscape as we all know is full of uh, disasters is full of compounding risks both of markets of finance of damages to infrastructure geopolitical risks and also new market opportunities that are emerging uh, particularly for a country like india which is now gaining the interest of investors all across the world and uh, what does all of this mean for youth action what does what is the meaning of youth here are we uh, a constituency that will be future employees and employers are we decision makers in this transition or um, are we actually congregated as a constituency in the first place are we seeing ourselves you know as as one uh, constituency that's talking amongst each other are people in north and south of india east and west actually do they have a national platform and community to discuss their issues whether they are coming from the rural or the urban space whether they are in the agriculture sector or the tertiary sector uh, those are some of the broad uh, things that underline Uh, a lot of my thoughts but in this present landscape one thing is very clear that uh, there is an economic case for climate action now in that economic case for uh, and i i believe i'm audible to everybody i've just begun to speak uh, so i hope you guys can hear me but um, you're audible sure thank you um one thing is very clear which is you know in the last 5 years uh, is that the economic case for transitioning 
to a green supply chain, to a green business model, to a green design is there. And one thing that I've learned in my experience is that we could be all the more passionate and serious about acting on climate, uh, resolving these risks. But until and unless there is an economic case for it, uh, politicians are less likely to move for it. Big corporates are less likely to invest you know, things. And of course, different stakeholders have different views. A corporate might tell you that, you know, we need certainty in policy because the investments we make take a 20 year time frame and we cannot, you know, have a changing environment continuously. But in this larger context of compounding risks of, you know, emerging markets for India and also what it really looks like between a two different stories of, you know, rural and urban India, what is uh, the meaning and context of youth action. Where do we see ourselves? And one of the most useful documents that I found in that space was is actually one of your reports. So I will not uh, preach what you have already told the world, but uh, I will towards the end, you know, touch on uh, those aspects and the recommendations and ask your you all as you know, do you see movement on those fronts? Um, green economy. Um, there is an important challenge before India which is that of that India has to continue to industrialize while it also decarbonizes. So the rest of the world, on account of cumulative emissions at the historic level, emerged, developed on the back of coal. Uh, India and a lot of other markets, but no market is uniquely like us. China is one, but it's also fairly advanced, uh, is... We have a huge market, we have a huge population, new demand for energy, and we have to meet it through clean energy sources. And of course, you know, this is a fairly advanced community in terms of knowledge and familiarity with the subject. So we know why we need to move away from fossil fuels. What are the risks? But the truth and the reality of the matter is that uh, India will continue to use fossil fuels uh, for the next two, two or three decades, very much, you know, in, in accordance with the time frame till 2070. And we may peak our fossil fuel use uh, in 2040 and then choose to come down. And by that time, our solar power, our wind, our hydro grids would be capable enough to deal with the load and the demand in, uh, in energy intensity that we have. So what really is a green economy that the world is now trying to achieve, whether it is a developed country like US, which is huge, a country like Indonesia, or a semi-developed country uh, in Europe, you know, or developed, which is small and has smaller needs. Now, the UN Environment Program uh, defines green economy as a low carbon, resource efficient, and socially inclusive economy, right? And uh, where employment and growth in income are driven by public and private investment into economic activities, infrastructures, and assets that allow reduced carbon emissions and pollution, energy efficiency, resource energy efficiency, and prevention of loss and uh, of biodiversity. Uh, three things are very important here. Low carbon, resource efficient and socially inclusive. At the moment, when we are talking about um, youth, uh, there is a strong socially inclusive angle at the international level and the very rural state level. But the low carbon element and the resource efficient angle that when it talks about youth, it is either, either looking at innovators who are coming up with new climate technologies and startups or consumers uh, who are, you know, beginning to adopt to sustainable lifestyles. Um, India, how is it positioned? Of course, we have a nine, uh, 2070 target, but also in 2022, November, we came up with a long-term strategy for uh, India's low carbon development. And that strategy outlined six key pillars for India, right? And I, I just want to outline this so that then we can, you know, dig a little deeper and look at, you know, what is a youth piece in it? Is there a youth piece in it already? Is it fleshed out? Or is it people like you and me who have to now create that dialogue of active uh, connecting the dots between the technical, the social, the political, and the element of how, where does the youth fit in there? Because I uh, am not of the belief that mere advocacy is the answer. Uh, I have seen and been a part of that world for some time. And I think that real change uh, is much different from uh, participating in conferences and advocating for change because um, it does not really 
yield the kind of it does not address the problems that we have at the ground level and which is why i'm also choosing to talk about ground realities because i think there is where we can learn so much more and i can learn so much more from all of you so the six key pillars seven key pillars of india's uh, long term strategy for low carbon development as laid down by the ministry of environment and forests and climate change is firstly on uh, electricity systems and low carbon development second on uh, efficient and integrated low carbon transport systems so electricity transport second is material efficiency in buildings and sustainable urbanization fourth is economy wide decoupling of emissions and low emission low carbon industrial system so you've got electricity you've got buildings you've got transport you've got industry third co2 removal and related engineering situations uh, uh, solutions now that is a very different piece but it's a piece that will be relevant for countries when you're trying to go net zero some corporates are still talking about getting into carbon capture and utilization and storage or even more a slightly politically controversial and scientifically unproven geoengineering as a matter i've done some work on that front and youth perspectives are also missing there and somewhere present but in a limited fashion uh, the other element is Uh, enhancement of forest and vegetation cover and third the financial and economic aspects of low carbon development in this larger space uh, there is no direct hook for you know connecting the interest of youth and which is why um, the theme of today's talk looks at three areas health education and jobs because these are areas where both youth uh, face challenges but also uh there is an opportunity to provide and build capacity for the youth but also develop leaders and the next generation of uh green workers of uh, of entrepreneurs and of professionals in these very sectors that can provide for india's rising population and somewhere account for the social infrastructure that will help us yield the demographic development your your inaugural report on not inaugural but the report on just transition and youth spent some time looking at demographic dividend dividends and it's important that uh, to highlight again that it is not necessary that a country with a young population in this decade will necessarily benefit from the working high income uh, high earning uh, population in the next decade because we need to cultivate and nurture that talent and that is where uh, we are seeing two different indias developing uh, on a range of issues we see a uh, online ordering uh, quick uh, spending and uh, high earning urban class that's emerging and we also see uh, a different situation in the rural world and i'm not at all saying that the rural world is opposite of what is happening in the urban story but the rural story is different and there is different kind of hope and a different kind of market that perhaps needs to be now tapped into um coming back to where i was in this larger picture uh, one thing is very important to highlight that um there are issues well i'll i'll, I'll come to that in a while the the issues i've segmented those issues separately um important story about the two different indias um at the urban level we see two different indias there is some level of climate consciousness about how the climate crisis is beginning to affect your quality of life um there is a strong focus on building tertiary skills in the climate space um people would are keen to study public policy and i feel that you know most of us including me and some of members in the audience fall in that bracket people who are developing tertiary skills in the climate space be it policy be it research be it, you know green sustainable finance and we are trying to look at climate as a as not only a passion but also a career right and then that's important because you uh, they are combining their climate consciousness with a career aspiration at the rural level um there is vulnerability of a different kind because uh infrastructural facilities are not you know at the same level and for 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 different reasons uh, there are limited opportunities and a gap in skills which is why the possibility of the kind of jobs the kind of sectors people can move into uh, is very different um, i am privileged to be part of this delhi ncr belt where i studied law 
moved into policy international relations now looking at you know climate more carefully because the kind of skill set and training i got allowed me to pursue different different things you know connecting the dots and this story would have been very different of much more challenging it if it was emerging from a different city i don't want to generalize but i want to just uh, be mindful of my own privilege in this space because uh, as a member of the youth a community myself you know till the age <laughs> persists uh, it is important to highlight uh, what you've got easy uh, but at the same time the rural community is at the cusp of choices the youth is at the cusp of two kinds of choices one is um, to sit and change their reality by making systems better right uh, making agriculture more resilient uh, connecting uh, technology and traditional uh, practices building community led social enterprises that have the new market to improve quality of life and create co benefits for health economic empowerment and uh, and community ownership of decision making and resources now that is the silver lining in this india story at the moment we are pretty much exhausted the urban story now we will see change but uh, change from the human resource angle but we will not see new infrastructural changes new designs of imagining cities in already established cities uh, because these cities are filled they are populated and they are at an excess of resource consumption now the other side is of this cusp of choice is what uh, rural youth at the rural level feels about in terms of wanting a better life of course every segment of the youth wants a better life but their idea of a better life is centered on um, globalization and i'm not at all judging i and i've framed this conversation to be a bit policy a bit uh, social and a bit anthropogenic so that we can you know bring those perspectives together because nobody really is talking about just transition and youth from that angle i i spent a lot of time uh, looking at literature uh, your reports were very helpful but at the same time nobody is bringing these different perspectives into picture uh, you know the social angle the legal policy angle together with what really it means to be on the ground and the other cusp of choice now coming back to what i was saying is that of wanting a better life on the back of um globalization westernization migration and moving out of their current homes um and this migration and or displacement story has climate at the heart of it because we do not have the capacity to provide for the needs of everybody in cities and the future of india for the next 20 30 years is going to be built in tier 2 cities and new townships and con and you know clusters that will provide the opportunity to develop new green infrastructure now the question is that nobody can of course tell anybody in the country where they should live and move but are we creating an ecosystem where people feel encouraged to move out or are we creating conditions where people fo feel forced to move out of their natural social habitats and you know find new pastures that is a question that uh, is really at the heart of the migration story because um, nobody is moving because of one factor it is when climate vulnerability coupled with a vicious cycle of poverty and dependence on social uh, structures gets combined and you are hit by one compounding crisis it could be covid it could be you know loss of a family member or it could be just lack of social protection and you know policies that allow you to uh, get get access to capital that you have to move out and i'm still talking about both the educated and the un uneducated seg segment in both parts of india but uh, the commonality between both of these segments is the adverse health crisis they face um is uh, the fact that they have to fend for themselves right our system is very different from most other countries particularly on the developed side we do not have an unemployment uh, unemployment allowance like europe or the us has we do not have a mandatorily uh, government spending and free education yeah. like most uh, european countries have where you can study from school till college and we do not have the kind of uh, high paying opportunities in the government unless you are really qualified by which you have to already invest 10 years or so in building that profile 
so in this context of having to fend for themselves and facing adverse health crises uh, the conversation on a better future really rests upon economic opportunities we we have to make an economic case for just transition for stakeholders in industry government and local bodies to make the case it is not the climate crisis that is forcing a coal mine to close it is the fact that uh, it is becoming economically unjustifiable to incur the costs of operating a thermal power plant it is becoming economically burdensome to provide uh, for losses and damages that are happening and in this larger context uh, a case for a just transition has to be an economic case as well and we have to make sure that policies designed further are scientifically relevant and we are able to use all the levers that we have technology policy uh, behavior and finance now this is a, this is a broad context the reason um, i wanted to spend some time discussing health uh, but i will keep it pretty short uh, for one reason because uh, we are facing a health crisis we are seeing how poor uh, health quality is affecting life but it is only you know in the next decade and decade after when we begin to see those effects on duration and life spans and when new research will outline how uh, the pollution crisis in in uh, carbon intensive economies has caused a, a massive health you of course have other elements of you know mental and social health regular fatigue but we can move beyond that because there is much to cover and discuss and i i want to leave some uh, room open in this space uh, we've discussed uh, some bit on understanding youth in india from these two sides at least this is my way of looking at you know how we can distinguish the constituency but also identify commonalities uh, on the education bit um, there is one very important piece which is on capacity building uh, it is a part of your recommendations it is a part of almost every youth report that i have read it is a part of every conversation that you know people make about uh, we need to build capacity of youth to be part of the just transition they need to be on the table to decide uh, and you know make decisions they need to be able to provide and have access to resources but before we move to that my broad honest reflection about uh, this issue about capacity to building and jobs is that we need to move past uh, talking about advocating for youth engagement in tra just transition decision making uh, reality is that we are currently and maybe for the next few years going to be stuck with the talking because uh, nobody really know what the right pathway for acting on just transition is because any new initiative will have to take into consideration the political economy have the vision for bringing together the interest of different stakeholders and uh, put together the and, and and have 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 both a focus on capacity building but be backed by political blessing and funding and that is a big risk because the phase has come if we are to look at the 2030 targets of the paris agreement and the recent unep gap emissions report which says 8.5% emissions have to be cut every year globally right the time has come for conversations to move away from talking to an implementation stage but uh, the pathway is not there clear yet uh, just transition as a term emerged in 1980s in the us when uh, workers were beginning to complain about the impact of new water and air pollution regulations on their industries on their employment and then the issue came up a just transition and now in the 2000s and the 2010s and mostly in the 2020s we are again hearing just transition from a very different line right and on, on an issue which all of you you know are building your expertise have have significant uh, knowledge and experience um coming to this front what is the kind of capacity building that we need to look for in terms of um uh, what should we teach and learn you know with the, to the next generation if you are looking at people who are building tertiary sectors and you are looking at people who want to not transition technical skills from working in a coal mine to perhaps in a solar factory right do we have uh 
the framework, the national framework of institutions or a policy that outlines these needs, right? The national education policy was revised earlier this year. I did hear a long podcast on it, but we did not look at, you know, on the, I did not at that time look at the just transition element of it. But the question is that how are we preparing for the new economy and what happens to those on the ground? Because the opportunities they have are also limited and the competition in a country like ours is huge. Uh, so how can we prepare the next generation of climate and energy uh, sector professionals? Which green sectors have a skill gap like technicians, operators? This is something that we are hearing often uh, from industry. I hear this often from people from the industry that we are building new green infrastructure, but there is a dearth of the right kind of people because things like ESG has only begun to be taught in the last two years. Uh, things like uh, how to operate renewable energy uh, plants, systems, equipments are new skills. And we are not only technologically behind some other countries, which we are trying to leapfrog, at least on emerging areas like green hydrogen and, you know, make sure that the world jumps together and not like other technologies where, you know, solar came to world much earlier and then India caught up. LNG came to the world much earlier than India caught up, but can we make sure the new frontier of technologies, we have the right kind of standards, policies, development process, and the skill set to implement that. So, whereas we are looking at established technologies like solar or new technologies like hydrogen, um, how do we prepare the next, next clientele? Are, are we looking at are universities mindful of the opportunity and are they able to present the case to students to transition that? I think that is a key question that needs to be looked at. That's a question that I would like to look at more deeply in terms of how, how can the education sector really provide relevant and uh, actually relevant uh, skills and education? Because the silver lining, the common hope uh, amongst all of the youth is the innovative mindset that the Indian mentality has that the Indian civilization has and, you know, how we are able to, across the world, all young people are able to beat the odds. So if they are equipped with the right skills, they can do this. Um, that being said, um, that being said, there are some issues which, uh, you know, so, so what kind of capacity building is is needed? Yeah. I would like to touch some some bit on that. And the kind of capacity building, I feel there are four different kinds of capacity building. One is broad sensitization and social awareness at all levels, because until and unless uh, there is a shift within our view of thinking about how we consume, what we consume and why we consume it, right? We really cannot move to a low carbon development model. If our sustainable so our consumption patterns continue to be the same, then no matter how much solar power and hydro and wind we may create, uh, things will be difficult uh, and, and we will not be able to, you know, really tie things around and touch net zero or even create something which is, which the planet can handle. And this is something that, you know, if we dig deeper in the issue, uh, we find that a lot of indigenous wisdom and traditional cultural wisdom from both our countries and other countries, right, is going to be very relevant. The Indian civilization is much ahead in that front. And how do we club that wisdom with present day policy making and make sustainability aspirational? People do not want to uh, drive a Tesla in the US because it is an electric vehicle. People want to drive Tesla because it is sexy and it is a social status. It is, it is a symbol of prestige. So how do we make sure that uh, cultural norms, emerging cultural norms like minimalism or building a circular econ economy or reusing stuff that a lot of people uh, who are not as economically privileged as others are doing normally that we may have done as children, you know, in our households with, with limited income is, is, is the same stuff that we teach as values and principles to the next generation. Right. Those, those are important questions, which is why in the four types of capacity building, I think that the youth needs, uh, it has to be one on broad, sustainable behaviors and sensitization, uh, because there is no uh, alternative uh, to that. Second is technical skill development for green jobs, particularly 
uh, in the renewable energy sector. Uh, and there is an unmet demand from employers, which, you know, I, I just listed about. So sustainable behaviors and sensitization. Second is uh, capacity building uh, for technical skills and development for green jobs, particularly. Third, uh, tertiary skills, right? Most of us fall in that category if we are working in the policy space, but issues like renewable energy policy, uh, issues like sustainable finance, ESG, uh, in terms of how uh, climate and uh, the de the industrial movement is linked in terms of decarbonizing industry, it's all going to be key. And the fourth and the fourth part is building resilience for survival uh, in nature based sectors, particularly agriculture, because we cannot again have we do not have an alternative. India is not only the breadbasket of the world, but it also is a self-sufficient country in many regards. And if our agricultural productivity is getting hit by increasing patterns, and there is limited social and technical protection schemes for farmers, and there is an increasing vicious cycle that is tying, you know, uh, low produce with poverty, with uh, with you know a lot of resource drain in the sector. How do you increase resilience? Is it new technologies? Is it also new social protection schemes? Is it also in options, national interventions? So that is also an area where we need the role of youth to be key and we need to build resilience in that space. So these are the four areas, sustainable behavior and uh, sensitization. Second, technical skill development for green jobs. Third, tertiary skills in the climate space. And fourth, uh, resilience in agriculture. That these four are, are key skills. So in this larger context of who should be teaching, what should be taught, how should it be taught, and you know, what kind of skills that should be, you know, outlined. Th these are the four broad objectives, which is why uh, I also really liked uh, your recommendation of an PRL or RPL primary learning in the youth community that somebody who's transitioning from a coal sector to another area should have a certificate of their skill set because not all people who are contractual laborer, laborers, daily laborers have access uh, to uh, formal education or the time and investment to make towards, you know, three years to get a degree and then get in the market. So these, these soft documents or they, they will have not soft documents, but these are important ways to uh, create space for this constituency in the job market. Uh, that said, we, we, we are at 35 and you know I'll, I'll speak for maybe 10 more minutes and then we can move into discussion. Um, the issues that I really want to, the three issues that are the heart of this, which is coming out less, are migration and displacement, uh, which we've slightly discussed, sustainable lifestyles and behaviors, and third is environmental justice right but before we look at the third issue uh, there is also one important um, moral and ethical consideration um, which is we've seen over development in the cities at least in terms of uh, resource consumption and wastage is it morally and ethically sound to ask people who in the other part of India, the rural part of India, the people who are the, on the ground of these just transition policies to not pursue the same track to a decent stage and, and develop as per the aspirations that they may have, right? It, it is the same challenge that, you know, it is, it is a question of equity of, of what India asks developed countries at the negotiations level and conference of parties that you've developed, you've taken care of your populations, how and why should we not, right? Likewise, the kind of development story we've seen at the urban level in certain metro cities in India, is it not okay? Or is it morally and ethically sound to ask uh, people not to pursue the same track of development in those very cities for poor people and people outside of cities? Because that's an important issue of sustainable lifestyles of how do we change aspirations? And unless we change aspirations and we ch make sustainability a market trend and also something which is accessible to all uh, it will not be the case and that is again where youth let startups you know have a key role to play um, 
key thing on environmental justice this issue usually comes on two fronts when a new industry is being set up right it could be a coal mine power plant or it could be an, an industry and the kind of impact it has on local natural diversity uh, biodiversity on land ownership and on impact on livelihoods right that is a that is a field in which environmental justice comes into picture and it is often led by communities in the last few years once that now solar has been mainstreamed enough we are seeing issues of environmental justice emerge not just with corporate and carbon intensive industries but also with solar plants and factories in terms of how do you really provide for uh land management you know and the kind of impact new clean energy infrastructure is going to have and is already having on green lands grasslands and whether it is impacting rights of communities or when new hydropower plants are being set up in the hills uh, and that energy being created at those stations are, is all directed towards the cities what kind of quality of life and impact on the environment is being dealt and uh, felt by local communities now that angle of environmental justice is going to get a third spin of just transition because i feel just transition does not really squarely fit in mitigation adaptation or loss and damage the three broad layers of of climate policy instruments or field or of areas uh, just transition is a part of all these three in one way or the other and um, in which is why environmental justice is going to be a key part not just for the youth but also for communities affected by it because uh, soon if it is not managed properly right if the transition is not just or there are delays then it will become an issue of injustice and it will be very much uh, economic and environmental justice combined so we will see different stakeholders fighting for environmental justice across a 50 year time horizon earlier it was communities indigenous uh, representatives then it became villages now it will be uh, specially affected communities and and the challenge is that these stories are not reaching uh, the national level uh, these these stories are not capturing the attention uh, at the national level which is why um, i feel a dedicated setup like yours is 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 a very very important uh, development in our larger indian policy landscape and you know i, I congratulate all of you uh, for taking up and doing what you're doing it, it allows people like me to also associate ourselves and dig deeper on these issues um there is of course one silver lining which i briefly mentioned which was an untapped market of community led social enterprises this is a story that is very much developing in tier 2 and tier 3 cities this is a story that can be scaled across india uh, this is a story that india is now one of the leaders and that story is about clean energy based productive appliances and communities that are creating uh, co benefits of economic empowerment and health and access to services now now most of this falls in the window of dre which is distributed renewable energy people using uh, dre based chilling machines to sell cold milk dre based machines to you know churn crops keep medicines cold dre based appliances to make food items or process uh, manufacturing uh, things and that is creating economic viable economic opportunities for women for new people in the workforce from the community and also for the youth and that is a silver lining that perhaps uh, can really be uh, mainstreamed can be scaled in india india is the first country in the world uh, that has a national dre policy after the success of you know what we've seen in other states uh, my previous organization cw runs a program called powering livelihoods uh, that uh, supports 20 25 interesting entrepreneurs from these cities mostly women led who are doing some kind of work based on clean energy appliances and i feel um, i would encourage you know for 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 colleagues at the center here and also all of you you know individually to see if there is a scope and window for to to create a segue for the youth affected 
by the closure of mines and coal plants to look at uh, DRE based appliances and productivity and livelihoods as 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 a way forward. Uh, and you know what are the key levers that could be exercised because it is not cost intensive, but it has many different co benefits. Um, apart from this, some broad thoughts you know on the closing side. Uh, one is on who needs to act, what is the role of different stakeholders, and how can law be leveraged in this space? The government at the state and central level can primarily create pathways, can create schemes, right, uh, to develop existing, modify existing schemes for having people get trainings or some kind of an alliance for moving away. Uh, the universities and local educational institutions will have a key role in building the capacity across the four areas we spoke. And, and the private sector will have a key role, both those who are directly involved in the business of coal and those who have a mandate to use their corporate social responsibility, the CSR funding, and create viable opportunities for skill development and training, but also uh, invest in innovative social protection schemes. Because until and unless, you know, uh, the, the saying that, you know, you serve a man of fish, uh, you provide for one meal, you teach him to fish, you, you know, taken care of, a lot of meals you've got him a job so no kind of social insurance or uh, national policy will be sufficient unless you are creating up 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 youth ko saksham bana rahe hain ek nayi zindagi start karne ke liye aap communities ko taiyar kar rahe hain so for that i think the role of private sector and csr is going to be key there is no active focus on that front yet most csr conversations are focused on of course it is you know, one year they would like to support the girl child, next year jute bags, third year, you know, uh, clean organic colors. But the issue is that there is no mandatory focus so far uh, on this area. And I think CSR, at least for companies directly involved in the business of coal, should be targeting how they can uh, facilitate just transition by aggregating capital and putting it through. Um, I, I think deeper on this issue slightly. I tried to, and I realized that we are talking about what everybody should do, but the youth and one of the key areas where the youth can play a key role is activism and political representation. We have, of course, seen youth-led political leaders, you know, emerge in the country and, you know, go from local to state to national level. But this issue of just transition needs that strong participation of youth to who emerge, who come from that political economy. And of course, politics at the most local level is not clean and plain as any other level. And it will not just be about transition. But until and unless there is an impetus and there is a mobilizing of the constituency of voters in that space, uh, that kind of change that is expected, that is wanted will not come. And I, I, the more I thought about it, I really thought that uh, political representation uh, and activism of youth, at least at these levels and these constituencies where the just transition conversation is on the ground is going to be key. Uh, so this is my broad uh, space. Some reflections on what really is missing is a focus on both developing emerging leaders in the urban and the rural space. Right now, when you look at emerging leaders, you know, who are participating in international conferences selected by the UN, uh, it ends up becoming a circle of uh, urban folks who are entering a golden community of opportunities. But we need to focus on local and state-based uh, voices. They may not be polished. They may not be as educated as, you know, most of others but we really need to make sure that these opportunities are available to all otherwise you know it's the same challenge that the un bureaucracy will you know it we, it won't really get get through the other is there's a lack of mentorship and incubation uh for youth at the tier two and tier three uh, setup and this is where again uh universities and local private bodies will have, have to play a key role to provide a viable pathway for the youth to move away and you know identify those opportunities where they can grow. Third, environmental sensitization and behavior 
seems to be growing on a daily basis and we still seem to be making uh, errors. I, I, I live in Delhi at the moment, uh, in Ghazibad, and uh, we saw crackers on Diwali despite the dangerous pollution three days ago just because there was a rain. So so we are, we are failing in that front and it is a key reflection that we can't really, until we solve what we need for and who we are, we can't change the world. And the third is... Uh, lack of a nationally integrated community of change makers. Uh, currently, there are silos. The story in one particular state is developing within that state. The story in Delhi and Mumbai is different. The story in national level is different. We need a national platform of community, uh, a community where, you know, youth from different constituencies can connect, talk and exchange and even build ideas and go beyond the advocacy to actually creating solutions. I think that is when they will be able to change the scenario. And uh, most of these ideas, you know, found resonance with the report that the center has produced a couple of months ago on just transition in the youth. So I'm very glad and thank you so much.